I want to invite a particular friend of mine, uh, Reb Semcha Raphael, who's one of the Vatikim of Jewish Renewal, the first executive director of B'nai or Religious Fellowship over 40 years ago, uh, to just set the tone of what he learned from his Rebbe. And just to put this, some of the rest of this program into context for us. Reb Simcha, are you ready? Uh, I am ready. It's always good to be here and see people from so many different strands and weaves of my life. So I'm glad to be here with everybody. And uh, let's see, here's what I want to talk about. I want to do something I'm calling five things Five things I learned from my Rebbe. Five teachings I learned from my Rebbe. And I'll just read them now, and then we'll go off, off the, the, the screen share, and I'll talk about them. Envision the Jewish future. Find the inner dimension of Jewish rituals. Think large. Imagine making the impossible possible. Be willing to think and act out of the box beyond the old paradigm. And Koldavar Bito, everything in its organic time. So I met, well, I'll say that in a second. Reb Zalman was the first Jewish teacher I'd ever heard talk about the Jewish future. My teachers in United Talmud Torah of Montreal Hebrew Day School were Holocaust survivors. They were doing the work of what Reb Zalman called reconstruction. Mr. Meldung would say, what did you do this summer? Oh, I went to camp. I went to camp. We also went to camp. And he would show us his numbers on his arm, traumatized a whole generation of kids. My other teachers, when I got to the Jewish studies, we learned Biblical tradition, rabbinic tradition, med medieval philosophy, religious history of Western civilization, early Jewish modernity, but it was all looking at the past. Reb Zalman taught us, and in, in some ways over the years, empowered us to envision and to create the Jewish future. And that's the legacy that we are we are living and we are we are grateful for find the inner dimension of jewish ritual practice i first met reb zalman at shabbaton at mcgill university hillel and in my own characteristic style i arrived a little bit late and he was with ilan at the time and he was lighting shabbos candles and the first words out of his mouth were, we light the outer light to remind us to light the inner light. Again, never had I heard anybody connect Jewish ritual practice with inner spirituality i mean i'm of the generation that that hung out with many of the gurus you know i don't know if some of you had this guru my first guru was swami mishugananda the, the 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 disciple of swami chutzpananda so when i heard spirituality in a jewish frame over something that i had grown up with all those years lighting shabbat candles usually it was you did something jewishly because it it was geschrieben it was written down but here, the sense of an inner dimension, of finding our own inner experiences in the Passover Seder, of, 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 of he did something on, on uh, Shabbat for grown, on Hanukkah for adults, and, and, and finding what we needed to do to cleanse our own inner, te inner temple. That was very much of his gift, again, to all of us, and I'm grateful for that. Number three is think large, imagine making the impossible possible. So we were working together in Philadelphia in 1980 to 1982. 
and spring, or I think it was February of 1981, we were getting ready for Birkat Chama, the blessing of the sun that takes place every 28 years. And we were talking about how to observe it. And all of a sudden, Reb Zalman goes, I got it. Let's go to the Empire State Building. And at that point, there was the Martin Steinberg Center for Jewish Arts in Manhattan that was that was run by Jeff Obler, Alava Sholem. And he, he, so we, we, we spoke with Jeff and we were able to get permission to do a, an early morning service on the 57th floor of the Empire State Building. Allegedly, Shlomo did something on the World Trade Center, though I never knew that, but we were also in tune with the Aquarian Minion and other 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 communities doing that we were sort of the very early stages of building the 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 Beneor network and then uh, uh, he was he had his own fm mic and he was picking up all of the radio stations that had their antennas on the 57th floor of the new york state building and um and then he released we released 70 balloons as the sacrifice to the 70 nations I do remember after staying up all night, falling asleep on the floor of the Empire State Building lobby, but it it was really a, a, a um, just a transformative experience and one one of the most amazing ritual moments in my life. Number four is being willing to think and act out of the box, out of the old paradigm. Gilarez and I got married thirty eight years ago in Knoxville, Tennessee, and in good Southern fashion, we had a, we had a fancy rehearsal dinner at a restaurant, at, at a hotel in, in uh, downtown Knoxville. And after the rehearsal dinner, Reb Zalman comes to us, he says, tomorrow when you sign your ketubah, the moon is going to be vo void, of course. If, if you're astrologically savvy, you know exactly what that means. Otherwise, it's it's one of those moments when there's a there, there's no angular there's no planet in angular relationship to the moon, and it creates those moments when three out of your four appointments get some, get canceled and things that start don't come to fruition. So he said the moon is void, of course, tomorrow. So I want us to do Kenyan tonight, and he said follow me, and he had found a staircase up to the roof of the hotel that led to where the sun sphere was from the knoxville world's fair if you were if you google knoxville world's fair a big huge golden globe will show up and he brought us under that sun sphere and we he said bring bring, bring your a and bring some friends and so he had the 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 men walking around one circle doing a chant Kashoshana ben hachochim ken rayati ben habanot, and he had the women walking around the counterclock sir by counterclockwise circle, and I don't remember exactly what that chant was. Then we signed our kinyan. He had us. He had us sign the Lieberman clause that he that he was he was advocating for for Gitten, and uh, he threw an I Ching, and uh, there was a security guard there who was looking around like. What the hell is going on here? You know, they, they never saw that in Knoxville before. And uh, it's 38 years later, and uh, we're still trekking along. So I guess it worked to do it. Um, what he, But what he did was, he, he, you know, which leads to the next one, he was willing to think and act out of the box. So I want to say something about him thinking and acting out of the box. He also... He is, he also blew a shofar after he read the the, the ketubah under the chuppah in a conservative synagogue in Knoxville. Uh, Gila, one of Gila Razel's elderly uncles said, and I can't quite emulate his his southern accent. He said, "Well, Vera, I don't know if we were really married after seeing that one." Um, how how am I doing for time? Am I, I you going to pull a plug on me? You could pick it up a bit. Okay, there's 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 one more. I'm I'm in in classical Zalman fashion. I'm not sticking to the to 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 the menu. I'm going to add one more. So it's going to be six things I learned from my Rebbe. Reb Zalman would say, 
I teach subjects, not students. He, if anybody ever took an academic course with him, he had great course outlines that he never followed consistently. Uh, that was one of his um, foibles and gifts that he, 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 he said, I, I don't teach subjects, I teach students. One time I was with him at a class on prayer he was doing at Re the Reconstructionist Seminary, the old Reconstructionist Seminary down on Broad Street, and somebody's fill-in box broke, and he stopped the class, and he spent the rest of the class teaching about what was in the tefillin. That was, that was a kind of classical moment of I'm not teaching a subject, I'm teaching students. I met him in 77, 76, and uh, for a variety of, he said, come study with me at Temple for a variety of reasons. I didn't. I went to the California Institute of now a, a Integral Studies. I met him again at the Aquarian Minion in 1979. And he said, like, you know, I have been here. I didn't, I didn't come to Temple. What are you doing? You, what, you know, I told him I'm in a graduate program. And what are you going to write your dissertation on? I said, I don't know. I'm not sure yet. I just did a paper on death and reincarnation in Eastern religions. I did something on death and, and death and afterlife in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. I might do something on death and Judaism. He said, good, here's what you're going to do. And he wrote on, on a little tiny piece of paper he used to carry around the name of Tusvarim. And he said, you're going to read these books and I am going to be on your committee. I was not a medieval scholar. But I read everything I could get my hands on, on death and afterlife and Judaism, and there was not a lot in those years. And my dissertation, Judaism's contribution to the psychology of death and dying, became uh, Jewish views of the afterlife in 1994. My first job after I got my doctorate in psychology was resident psychologist in a funeral home. And I have spent most of my professional career, not only, but largely doing Jewish death awareness education. So he had that gift to call out people's destiny. If we stopped right now, we just opened the mic and said, how many people had a variation on that theme with, with him? You'd hear a lot, a lot of stories. He really could see who you were and what you were called to be. He would say, I'm farsighted, I'm farsighted. The last thing I, I want to say of the six things I learned from my Rebbe is kol davar b'ito, everything in its time. And that's a principle I've taken with me. He had a very profound sense of accepting the organicity of life unfolding. And that was true in his own life because he was often impatient. He didn't feel sometimes that he was being 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 acknowledged for the work he was doing. Called of Arbito, everything in its own organic time. And so it's probably the end of my organic time to speak here this evening. And so I'm grateful to all of you. And um, I just want to say I get to see a front row seat of all of the machinations that uh, Reb Gila Reza goes through to pull this together. And so to you, I'll say at the beginning, kol hakavod for your wonderful, wonderful ecumen in, in, in creating this program today. And thank the other program. You. Thank you, thank you, Simcha, oh, for man. your support.